So today I'm delighted to have with me as a guest, Carl Pemberton. Um, Carl's the Managing Director of Active Chartered Financial Planners, based in the northeast of England. Uh, he's an award-winning uh, business, and I've known Carl and his business for a long time since we came across each other on a, um, a high-growth business programme some years ago. I don't know how many years ago, probably seven or eight years, if not a bit longer than that, Carl. Six, I think it is. Six from years ago, okay. So um, I'm delighted to have you along. What I want to do today is just explore... Um, you work in a very packed kind of market sector, but you set standards, I think, that people um, would be interested in how you do that, how you stand apart from the competition, and you've got an award-winning service business. So if I can just go through a few questions and get you you know, talking to the audience and inspiring them with your story, that would hopefully be something of interest. I'll do my best. Excellent. No pressure then. <laughs> so, Carl, you run a, a chartered financial planning business, and it's a very overcrowded marketplace. Obviously, there's lots of people providing financial advice and financial support, services support, etc. So how did you set out to be different when you originally started the business to make it you know, something that's uh, worthy of, of consideration? Because there's lots of me too people in that sector, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. I think our industry, as you say, is uh, quite... Uh, densely populated mm. and uh, technically on paper we all do the same job mm. um so you know you have to have a clear idea of what it is that you're looking to achieve what is your point of difference going to be and if you can articulate that well you um, stand a good chance of uh, getting ahead of much of your competition mm. and i think you know to lead on from what y- your point there is if you are clear on what it is that you're looking to achieve you articulate that well, then your potential clients or existing clients can actually resonate with that and actually use it as a reason to choose you rather than as a reason to choose your competitors. Oh, so and you make a positive choice rather than just, a, 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 I guess, a, an inert choice of that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I think technically you hear so many financial advisors just spout the same message of we do pensions, we do investments, we do mortgages, we do uh, insurances, etc. But you know, we all do that. So Mm. if somebody's putting the message out there of that's what we do, well, you're not actually telling your client or potential client or your potential market actually anything different to anybody else. So why would they choose you over somebody else? You're basically just throwing yourself right into that flooded market Mm. um, and and you will not stand out. So I think, you know, be creative, have a clear vision of what it is that you're looking to achieve. Once you know what that vision actually is, you can build from there. You can build a brand, you can build your culture, and you can actually set that point of difference Mm. so that when your message is put out there, whether it's on social media, whether that's in um, branding, whether that is online, um, or even doing podcasts like this, it's a way of articulating how you are different Mm. that technically none of your competitors can actually replicate. Okay. I mean, I've had the pleasure of working with your team a couple of times over the last few years and it does always impress me that culturally it just feels quite uh, natural there's nobody there who doesn't want to be there I think people in your team uh, buy into what the difference is and if they're doing that I guess they can articulate that very well to your existing clients and potential new clients so from a, a cultural point of view um, can I just ask you about going back to the start of things was what was the most difficult part of the original journey and how has that changed over the years in terms of, you know, differentiating yourself and, and creating the culture that, that is now the business and, 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 and helps to win such sort of high praise and awards? I think for me, I would say it was easy, mm. but I, I don't say that flippantly. I say it's easy because I was actually brought up working within Yorkshire Bank. Right. And in the mid-90s when I started with Yorkshire Bank, Yorkshire Bank's culture was very... Uh, family friendly, uh, very supportive, very open, and and it was a fantastic place to work. So mm. for me, you could say I've had that ingrained within me since I was 18 years old. Right. And as active now, there's no surprise, we've probably got, I think, six, seven or eight ex-Yorkshire Bank people actually working with us. So you could say we've not had to train that type of warm, welcoming family feel uh, as a culture mm. for for many of our team. That said, um, when we moved from the banking industry into the financial services industry, when I took over from uh, my father in 
2007, I think it was. Mm. Um, it was it was very different trying to take that culture into what was traditionally an IFA uh, type mentality and, and and type practice because. You know, let's not beat about the bush. That industry hasn't always had the best reputation. Mm -hmm. It hasn't always acted with the best interests um, of clients at heart. And, you know, there's been many times through the 90s and probably early 2000s where mis-selling, or call it what, or, uh, any, any other words, has actually occurred. So, you know, to try and establish a culture within financial advising and, and financial services was different because the people who were already in that sector, you had to change them. Yes. That was difficult. Uh, but for the people who were within that banking background where we brought them over, I would say it was easier for those because they already had it within them. Okay. I mean, that comes down to recruitment. I'll, I'll ask you a question about recruitment shortly, but that suggests to me, though, you've you've looked at people who are who've come from maybe a very hard sell background relation uh, 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 business into more of a, a, a soft relationship build, they're a better fit for you then in terms of the sort of active team? Definitely. And again, you know, like you say, that our industry's had a, a checkered history when you're going back. I know it's a very, very long time ago, but one thing that was great within the Yorkshire Bank culture was there was never this forced selling mentality back mm. in the 90s. Um, so we've never been in that uh, you know, on that side of the fence, really. So mm. it's nice to know you have a different set of skills to actually build rapport with people and actually build that long-term relationship does indirectly actually help you generate sales, if you want to call them sales. Yeah. Um, because people will feel more comfortable dealing with you. They will trust you more. And actually, if you care about your clients and you care about your staff, well, you are going to have more of a closed family type relationship where they will trust you to look after more of uh, you know their wealth okay well that seems it, it seems fairly obvious but a lot of people don't seem to get that so that that's one of the reasons i wanted to have you in was you know i know you've got quite an interesting story and a background as to how you've helped to grow you and develop your team so coming on to recruitment and this isn't really about financial planning and financial services necessarily but for any of the listeners and and viewers who are in what you call a crowded marketplace have you got any tips for um, recruiting and attracting the best talent in a crowded marketplace? Because um, that's really essential to the growth of your business, and it's really essential to the growth of businesses who are aspiring to be that. Yeah, we've we actually went. We've probably gone through two cycles, really. So, twelve years ago, we were trying to get traction. Mm -hmm. We were growing our business and trying to make uh, an impact. So, our priority 12 years ago or originally uh, was to get the knowledge and the skills based recruitment mm. from an industry that was hemorrhaging staff which was the banking industry going yeah. back in the sort of um, uh, 2009 2010 through the to the credit crunch if, if you want to call it that mm. lots, lots so, of talent but being let let go because of all sorts of circumstances. Before. Yeah, so suddenly it was rich pickings. We could go back to those people who we knew from the banks that we'd worked at. We knew they were very highly trained, very highly skilled. They had great client banks mm. that they could bring with them unchallenged. And we suddenly thought, we need to get these people. And uh, they came to us because of our vision of what we were trying to achieve. And I'm grateful that a lot of those people came with us on that journey and helped us get so far up the ladder, let's say. So it was volume based to start with mm. volume and skills based certainly to start with but then as we've matured as a business it's definitely gone down that culture and values route mm. and dare i say probably one of the biggest mistakes we've made as a business was recruiting somebody based purely on their cv right and on paper we thought this person is extremely talented they will move us up another notch and unfortunately, within literally a couple of weeks, we realized that, yeah, but they're also upsetting everyone else in the office because they didn't fit in culturally with, uh, you know, with the values that that we have as a business. You can't tell that from a CV, though, can you, Carl? That's the problem. You, you can t you can maybe get an inkling from an assessment centre or an interview, whatever, but these people who are, are often disruptive are pretty good at hiding that in those kind of circumstances. You, it's only when you get to 
embrace them in a workplace that you find out, you know, that, oh, this could be a bit of a challenge, I guess. Yeah, and and this person culturally did come from a different background to other to um you know, to the rest of our team in terms of hadn't come through the banking sector, um, had worked in big city firms, so mm. completely different to Teesside, as you know. Yeah. Um, and I think it was, there wasn't that warmth or sincerity and that team uh, approach to this person's um, uh, attitude to work, really. And, mm. it, and it just was a complete disconnect. And yeah, we had to let this person go. It was disappointing, but we lived and learnt from it. Mm. And We've got a really strong set of values as a company, which we've actually just redone this year mm. in 2019. And we actually got the team to to actually choose what our values should be. So we involved the whole team in that. And we are now using that, that matrix really as our core for recruitment. Mm. If somebody doesn't fit those values, well, we just won't hire them. It doesn't matter what skills they've got or what, what client bank they can bring. There's exactly. going gonna to be a rogue sort of presence within the business and, and cause more damage than good, I guess. Exactly. And, and again, rightly or wrongly, but our view is we can teach the um, professional skills of financial services. Yeah. We can help them develop a client bank and grow a client bank. Um, but sometimes you can't teach soft skills. It's it's either an, it, it's, it's natural to some people yes. and, it, and it depends on their experience that they've had for a, a good number of years and if they've got it mm. brilliant we'll recruit them and we'll find a place for them um and if they don't well i'm sorry but they're in the know, wrong they're, not, they're, they're in the not, wrong room that's right okay no worries well listen many businesses aspire to what you would call delivering customer service excellence and you put excellence in inverted commas for that sometimes it's you know, I don't know any business in the world that wouldn't say that's their one of their aspirations. And um, but many genuinely uh, don't deliver that customer service excellence. And and I know from experience that you guys um, at um, at Active definitely do that. So do you want to share a few tips with the the audience on, you know, how do you gen, genuinely deliver the holy grail of customer service excellence, where it it isn't lip service, it isn't buzzwords, it's genuinely you know what the customer experience is about. Yeah, so going going back to one of my earlier points, again, I know I'll, I'll go back on uh, talking about Yorkshire Bank and, uh, you know, that's what we did when we were teenagers all, all coming through the ranks there. It, you know, they genuinely cared about what they were doing. And I think there is a difference between if you care and enjoy what you're doing, you are going to, you know, put more into it to making sure that it actually is delivered. And again, going on to values, we as a business all have a general desire to improve mm. and and I always use the word to get better now if we all have this natural desire to get better then I think you will always try and deliver uh, excellence for your clients now I'll never define what better is for mm. each individual because every individual is different if somebody's already very very highly qualified well they don't need to take more exams mm. um, but someone might say well I want to be able to do the same amount of work in two hours a week less mm. well as long as you are better this time next year than you are now at something mm. whether that's personal or work related you know if it's work related well if you can deliver the same but better well as a business we should be better the mm. client should benefit from that if you as an individual want to do something better, i.e. you want to run a 5K or a 10K one minute quicker by this time next year, or you want to lose a stone in weight, or you want to just eat healthier, well, if you're in a better frame of mind, you'll probably deliver better things again whilst you're at work because you're more likely to be happier and such like. So I do think that desire to improve and be better does come through then in actually what you do deliver for your clients because you, you genuinely care and you're doing a good job. I think you do employ um, goal-orientated people as well, though, don't you? Or people who are looking at, you know, better's just part of their DNA potentially where, like you say, they, they might be looking to knock a minute off their 10K or they might just want to get around Tesco's quicker in terms of doing the weekly shop or whatever. You know, competitive in a good way, but definitely, you know, aspirational in terms of goal setting. Is that all part of the process as well? Yeah, because you don't want it always to be work-related or no. target-related or, you know, just, um, you know, these are the business KPIs and you should deliver more for the business as a KPI because mm. it's not about that. It's, you know, as I say, if you can do your job better 
in less time but delivering the same results. Well, I want people to have a great work-life balance. I want people, if they are finished and they have delivered what they need to deliver, get yourself a home and go yeah. and see your family and your kids. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't be working 12-hour days and uh, missing that time because, again, the, the reason why many of us left the banking industry in, in sort of the mid-2000s is because it became a bit of a slog and yeah. ultimately the sacrifice is normally yourself mm. or your family yeah and we don't want that to be part of the active dna we want people to enjoy coming to work we want people to enjoy um being at work and if they do do that and they do it with a smile on the face like you say it filters through to what the clients see day in day out don't right. get me wrong we're always going to have a bad day yeah, yeah. somebody's always going to wake up and uh, you know something's not right or something goes wrong in the office or you make a mistake mm. or uh, a client may uh, get under your skin or, and, and something like that you know we'll never avoid those things but the more positive environment that you work in the quicker those hurdles are to overcome okay I mentioned in the intro that you're an award-winning business and um, I'd like to explore a little bit about that if we can uh, Carl I, I see Loads of photographs of you in a, in, a, in a black tie dinner suit, standing there with your team with a, a plaque or a, you know, a nice shiny whatever award. And that's fantastic to see. So it's, it's got lots of good PR. It's got lots of, of, of good coverage. Um, you know, it's great to see that you, you, you've got those in place. Is that a deliberate policy of, of, of looking at awards as a way of, of differentiating or promoting your business? You know, what's, your, what's your culture around the whole awards kind of um, environment or the, or the awards industry? Because it is indeed an industry, yeah. isn't it? Again, I've got two types of approach to it. I personally don't like awards where you have to nominate yourself. <laughs> yeah, they always seem a bit incongruous to me. You're sort of saying, um, when I used to be... Um, a, a, a regional sort of uh, branch chairman of the Institute of Directors. I know you mm -hmm. are as well for, for sort of Teesside and, and uh, North East South, I think it's called yep. now, isn't it? Uh, we used to have an, a, an award ceremony and you could nominate yourself. We used to have people who nominate themselves for 14 different awards and they weren't qualified for any of them. And it always felt a bit odd to me, you know, that it's almost like uh, your self-recognition, but it, it seems a bit odd. So sorry to yeah. trample over that, but yeah, so you got the two types. Yeah, Go. so... I don't like the idea of nominating yourself for mm -hmm. an award. I think there's a bit, there's something a bit um, self-indulgent about that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think if you won an award that you've nominated yourself for, are you really the best, or are you? Have you wrote the best application, mm. or are you just the best of those applicants? You are not necessarily the best. Or have you entered a category that has got a fairly limited competition, and you? you you're the best of the small level of entrance, but it doesn't really mean you're the best on that basis, I yeah. guess, yeah. So as a firm, the awards that we've been nominated for, we have literally been nominated for. Mm. Somebody else has suggested us, somebody else has put an application forward, and if that's the case, then, yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to be considered that someone thinks of us in that regard to mm. be considered. Now, without wanting to sound hypocritical, individual awards... I would happily put members of our team forward for mm. for things like the um, uh, the Yorkshire Finance Awards last year. And one of our most successful, um, or two of mo our most successful people, Lisa Pontoni and Emma Cherrington, have both been nominated and shortlisted and won actually various awards purely because what they do is different mm -hmm. and it does stand out and they go that extra mile to actually um, make a difference to the people they look after whether that's clients whether that's just society and how they support kids at school or university and, and such like and be and be role models so as a business i want to champion those individuals that that do that and go that extra mile on behalf of active but and that, i think they but, deserve but, some recognition so i, I think will that's right forward. but that's very different though isn't it carl to someone self uh, um, submitting because that's you as their sort of director or it's a, a, a member of their peer group recognizing their success it's not them shouting you know me 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 it's mm. somebody else recognize it so i totally understand that and it does have a different feel about it and it, it must be great for them uh, anyone in that sort of uh, uh, position t to get the recognition of their of their peer group um and, and be nominated and sometimes nomination itself is a a really positive thing obviously you know awards sometimes it's more about the, the winning the recognition but 
actually just being nominated in some cases is, is, is a pretty impressive uh, feat, really, particularly in a competitive market, isn't it? Yeah, because we all we all probably do these extracurricular things outside of our day jobs, let's say. And I think if somebody is going to give that time up to self-develop or self-promote or help other people, well, they, they do deserve that pat on the back because, mm. you know, that is going the extra mile. That is out of their own time. Mm. They don't have to do it. And sometimes that can be a lonely place. Sometimes you can end up spinning lots of plates. And as we all know, Time's a precious commodity, so if somebody is prepared to do that, I think they do deserve a big pat on the back to actually say, well done, and that may well be motivational enough to keep them going and actually keep doing that Mm. um, rather than actually stopping at any point because we do owe society uh, a bit of our time to to actually give back, to encourage that next generation or whoever it might be Mm. to, um, you know, to remind them that they're uh, worthy people as well. So, you know, anything we can do to help. I think those of us who are lucky enough to, you know, be in good health and, 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 you know, financially stable and, and, you know, run businesses and and, and be inverted commas successful, it is is great to see that kind of uh, dedication back, isn't it? And, you know, you you as a business seem very um, switched on to, I guess the uh, the community that you serve and supporting you know local things that are going on. So that that the two are not disconnected. That people recognise that and nominate you for awards, and and it's all about culture and values and the fit for that. But you mentioned earlier about giving something up and, and you know people investing time and that kind of thing. Um, I want to pick up on something. You're currently chairman of the Institute of Directors for. The northeast of England for the, for for one of the branches up there. Obviously, that's a voluntary position. But it's got a lot of responsibility um, and calls on your time. So, um, the question I've got for you is: You're a busy guy. You run a very successful, growing business. Um, why why would you just add another mm. um, set of um, shall we say challenges onto your day job by running uh, well being the chair of 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 a, a you know prestigious organisation like the Institute of Directors? So my journey with the IOD started about five years ago and it was through a desire of me personally to upskill. The IOD's um, priority is to improve the knowledge and uh, understanding and capabilities of directors in this country. And I see through my job and see many, many brilliant people who run successful companies. But then some of the problems people face running a company are often not necessarily their own fault it's through a lack of training a lack of understanding and even when we met through the uh, you know the 10,000 small business program in uh, in Leeds there are a lot of people who end up running their own companies you know not really understanding the um, the requirements and the competencies needed to actually scale it and grow it if that's mm. what they want to do so the IOD for me were instrumental in getting me to where I am and therefore getting active mm. to where it is as a, as a company. Is that through education? Do education programs and chartered director status? Yep. That, was it those kind of things that you were, you were buying into then? Definitely. So I went through the chartered directorship program, mm-hmm. which is ridiculously arduous. It's long. It's um, very deep. But my God, it does teach you, actually, there's probably a lot of things I didn't know. But for that, I'm I'm quite grateful. Mm. And uh, the IOD as an organisation is a phenomenal organisation. That's you know, let's be honest, it, it it probably lost its way a little bit as a as a Yorkshire and a northeast region. It was very London uh, centric, and mm-hmm. a lot of what it did came from Pall Mall in head office, and it was almost like a a pushed out message from London, which. You know, it doesn't always resonate with those people in the northeast, does it? In the re- in the regions, as we exactly, would say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I think the IOD has actually realised that there uh, there are flaws in that model, mm-hmm. and they have given autonomy now for the northeast and Yorkshire regions to to evolve and actually okay, do what you want to do then within re- uh, within uh, um, you know the remits of of what the ID is about. So. It's an exciting time for the IOD to mm. suddenly actually say, go on then, make a name for yourself. Mm. There's there's no blueprint. I'm not stepping into anyone else's shoes. You've got an opportunity to say, okay, represent that Tees Valley mm. um, area 
and actually promote good practice within business, uh, promote great um, progression and development for company directors, and ultimately have a voice for business within that area that will go back to London representing my area, which I'm passionate about, to ultimately lobby government. Now, Two seconds. <coughs> Massive apologies, <laughs> listeners and viewers. I could not stop that tickly cough, so apologies, Carl. Yeah, so we obviously we we've got that autonomy to to ultimately lobby government. Now, if you'd have asked my school teachers thirty odd years ago that I would be doing this sort of position, they'd have uh, they'd have certainly raised an eyebrow or chuckled. Um, so it is, you know, I do pinch myself. I do think I'm sure there were much better qualified individuals than me, but I was approached to do the role, mm-hmm. uh, given probably the fact that I, I do have a voice and I, I'm not share, uh, not shy in sharing uh, my opinion. And being a passionate Teesider and gone through that chartered directorship route, they felt I was the uh, the perfect candidate to to take that seat, and okay. I'll happily give it my uh, my all. And how is it affecting your day job? Is it a positive thing? Is it a, a distraction? Is it you know, complementary? How are you finding the the balance of that? Because giving something up, i.e., you know, time, it's not always about return on investment at that time, but there's always an impact somewhere. How's it? How, how are you balancing the two? So. I have given up one of my other voluntary positions to take this role. Mm -hmm. I have had to give up uh, looking after a certain number of my clients, Mm -hmm. uh, which is difficult. But ultimately, I have faith in the business that we've built and the other advisors within the business to to keep continuing to look after those clients properly. And ultimately, again, going back to my other point of I have a desire, as as a business, we have a desire to be better. Mm. And I actually believe that by me taking this role will actually make me a better director and a better leader within my uh, within my business mm. and ultimately, hopefully, the area as a whole that it's going to put me um, out of my comfort zone. I'm going to have to learn. I'm going to have to learn on my feet. Mm. And hopefully, as every year passes, I will be a better all-rounded individual as a result of doing uh, this, uh, this role. So it, it's... A personal challenge for me to do it. Yep. I'm excited by it. And in every role I've ever done, I think, I've always started something from scratch. Mm. And I like the idea of being able to build something from scratch and actually create something and grow it. Mm. And I'd rather be the first person having a go at that and building it and then in two or three years passing that baton on to be able to step back than going in as the second or third chairman in five, six, seven years' time yeah. and having to fill somebody else's shoes. And following a, bru- a blueprint at that stage that might not be naturally a good fit for you at that stage anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier about your school teachers. We all have a... I, I don't think anybody ever ends up in the job that their school teachers would have said that you, you were mapped out to be. I certainly haven't, and I, don't, I know lots of people who haven't. But you strike me as a real lifelong learner. So you've gone through, you work in a very regulated sector. So there's lots of, of um, compliance and exams. I know you mentioned this, mm. uh, that this week alone, you've just had a you know, three hour written paper mm. to focus on. Uh, you've done chartered status for the IOD. You did the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program, which is a, a fairly intense uh, 12 module development program. Is there any correlation between your desire for lifelong learning and the passion you have for that and the success that you've had as a business in terms of not just you, but as as active uh, uh, financial, uh, sorry, chartered financial uh, um, business. I, I, is there any correlation between the success of the two? I would say 100%. I'm not a naturally academic person. Mm-hmm. Now, my wife is a head of English in a secondary school, so she's passionate about academic learning. Yeah. And... I always argue against it. Um, I think vocational learning or learning whilst doing a job, Mm. there there can be nothing better in my in my opinion. Because textbook learning before you've even started doing a job, well, ninety percent of it might not actually be relevant for what you're wanting to do. I'd rather give my all to something that I know is going to be relevant Mm. um, to my day job to actually help me improve, rather than passing a generic exam many, many years ago for something that I might or might uh, never need. Yeah. And again, my natural uh, motivation, let's say, is I, I thrive off learning from others. Mm. And I look up to people who've genuinely been there and done it before me. So 
could be something a completely different sector. But if there's a business owner who's been massively successful in whatever it is they've done, you know, I would, you know, I would, I'd look up the, to the minor and and actually think I want to replicate what they've mm. done. I want to be like them. So I almost see myself as a bit of a sponge where I will try and soak up as many. Um, different aspects of learning as possible and you know the iod does cover a lot a lot of that off in mm. terms of you know running a business in terms of the finance side the leadership styles um you know your roles and and regulatory duties as a director and then you know actually building a marketing strategy for your business you, you, that all all those things don't come naturally and are not covered in one particular course that i'm aware of anywhere else so yeah. learning from other people in business is is invaluable and I think that yeah on paper I'm a financial advisor but if I just was a financial advisor I wouldn't be able to add all these other skills mm. when dealing with business clients which invariably end up being my type of client uh, when you're talking about how they run their business and how successful they are to you know ultimately put their financial plan together it goes hand in hand I guess they have an expectation that you understand their world as well doesn't it so it doesn't do any harm to be uh, like you say, a sponge for, for knowledge and you know, in the business environment that you operate in. That's so, right. Okay, well, I've got one final question for you to hopefully inspire our listeners and viewers. Um, I've got anyone listening who's been inspired to consider creating a genuine award-winning business model, and hopefully there will be in terms of saying, well, I can see the advantage of that. What would be the one piece of advice, the golden bullet you would offer to say to them, this is your best chance of success to build a genuine award-winning business? in whatever sector, whether it's service manufacturing or whatever, what are the things they should be concentrating on? Definitely know your point of difference. Be clear about that point of difference and build a brand around that. And your brand should not just be your font, your colours, your logo, which everyone assumes it is. Your, your brand is everything. Your brand mm. is your culture. It's your message. It's your tone of voice. It's your language. It's the whole thing that is articulated that represents you as a business. Mm. And if you know your point of difference, you build a brand that then promotes that and be consistently clear and transparent about how you deliver that then um, you know you will stand out from from the rest and never stop learning. Never ever shut your mind off to learning and think I've made it because we can all be better. We can all improve. And I think um, a, a famous tea cider uh, alongside uh, yourself, Nick, is uh, Rob Smedley. I don't know if you've heard mm. of Rob. Rob is, uh, or the last I knew, he was uh, an F1 technician for Ferrari. Yes. I think he's been at a few teams now. But he talks passionate about passionately about the one percent world mm. and obviously in f1 one uh, percent's worth of difference a tiny little tweak can make a massive difference between coming first or getting a pole position to mm. being fifth or sixth you know if you've got one guy changing the tires at four seconds but the other guys are changing them at two mm. you know well you know that is going to affect the whole race and you know just trying to tweak little um one percent improvements you know, striving to be better, finding those little bits can eke out a massive wealth of difference at the end of the day. And so you don't need to be uh, revolutionary and, and constantly evolve and feel like you need to change things. Mm. But just always seeking out those little 1% um, can make a massive difference in keeping you I think uh, ahead. A, I think there's a, a well-known phrase in the marginal gains, as it's called, in yep. terms of your fine... Doing doing a uh, hundred things one percent better is better than doing one thing a hundred percent better because you'll change for the for the long term you'll change culture one uh, doing one thing a hundred percent better is a spike in performance but you'll probably end up going back to the old habits and old ways. Well, listen, Carl, it's been an absolute pleasure. Great to see you again. I haven't seen you for a little while. Um, your contact details will be on the end of the podcast for anybody who wants to talk to you about your inspirational journey, maybe some financial planning, we'll see. Uh, but ultimately, it's been a pleasure to understand the psyche and the culture of you, your business, how that's helped to to be successful and, and you know, where, where that lifelong learning is connected to you're genuinely standing out in a very competitive market. So, Carl Pemberton from um, from Active Charter Financial Planners, thank you for your time. Thanks, Nick.